interested in brain immune interactions. And I've been interested in this kind of crosstalk for, uh, for many years now, um, both thinking about how the immune system is important in the way the brain develops normally, but also how events that might impact inflammatory processes or cause inflammation during development might then lead to um, an increased risk of disorders such as autism. And so more and more of my research over the years has kind of shifted from thinking of these things in a very basic sense of just the kind of nuts and bolts of how neuroimmune communication occurs to thinking uh, about the direct relevance for, uh, for autism spectrum disorders. And so that's what I'll mostly talk about tonight. But just to kind of set the stage, um, you know, the, the sense that the immune system is important in brain development uh, has been a bit slow in, in coming in terms of um, it as a discipline. Um, but just within the last um, 20 years or so, and really I would say the last 10 years, there's been uh, quite uh, an increase in the interest and, uh, and evidence for the role that immune molecules, which we think of as playing um, really an ex exclusively a role in the peripheral, uh, so outside the brain, um, in terms of keeping us safe from infections and, and healing wounds, et cetera, um, it, it, we've really shifted to thinking about them as playing equally important roles and potentially very distinct roles in, in normal brain development. So if we kind of look at this schematic, this is a very simplified version of brain development, but we can think of it as occurring in, in kind of six um, basic steps, which is um, we all start out as just a, a neural tube and uh, more or less a flat sheet of cells that then folds in and becomes the developing embryo. And so we first have cells that are born in this neural tube and they begin to migrate and they then start to differentiate into the different cell types that the brain has, um, the astrocytes and the neurons and the oligodendrocytes. They then start to make connections with each other. Lots of connections start to get pruned back. Lots of cells die as a part of this normal, healthy development of the brain. And then eventually they make connections with each other called synapses. And again, many of those synapses are then eliminated or pruned back. So, you know, we've been studying this for, for many years now. And what we now understand is that if you think of each of these stages of development, that there are immune molecules that are critical in basically every step of how a brain is built. And so this is something we've been very interested in is um, if we look at, uh, again, the cell types that are present in the brain, this includes neurons, but it also includes um, glial cells, both astrocytes and microglia and oligodendrocytes. We know that these cells communicate with each other um, through a number of different signaling molecules like cytokines, for instance, and chemokines. And I won't go through this in detail, but, but we now know that based on many kind of basic studies, mostly in animal models, that the immune system is important in every single stage. Um, so the initial uh, proliferation of cell types in the brain, their migration to where they eventually end up, their connections that they make with each other, um, the pruning back of those connections based on experience, the engulfment of cells that die as a part of normal development. Um, so there's, a, there's kind of a role for the immune system in every one of those steps. So this becomes quite interesting when we think about, well, if we have such an important role for the immune system in normal brain development, what happens if you have an immune stimulus, immune stimulation of some sort that may result in inflammation, especially early in life, to the way the brain develops? Might there be some role for immune activation in causing abnormal brain development and therefore the risk of, of, of neuropsychiatric disorders, including autism? Um, and so one of the cell types here that I'd like to point out, because I'll talk about it quite a bit, are the resident immune cells of the brain called microglia. And this is a particular uh, focus of the work in my lab and has been um, for many years. And in fact, they are the cell type that first um, kind of got me interested in neuroscience broadly, but they're, they're, all, they're also the cell type that brought me to 
thinking about autism. So I'll kind of uh, talk about that. So again, they are the um, immune cells of the brain. They're a type of immune cell called a macrophage. Um, and we know that they are important for host defense within the brain, just as they're important for host defense in the body. Um, but we also know that they do things in normal brain development which are critical. So this, um, this is kind of a, a pretty cool illustration um, that was done by Julia Yellow, um, illustrating what we now know about microglia um, to be one of the important cell types in the brain to prune synapses. So they, they actually engulf synapses during normal development based on experience and based on genetic programming to remove synapses that are no longer needed. And again, this is a part of normal development. So I've been fascinated uh, by microglia for many years. So I just want to kind of introduce these cells because they're, they're the star of the show. Um, so um, these two people are um, widely considered some of the kind of fathers of neuroscience. Um, Ramon y Cajal. Um, is uh, a Spanish uh, neuroanatomist that has done many amazing uh, drawings, neuroanatomical drawings of the developing nervous system. And Rio Ortega is, uh, or was one of his students. And um, so Rio Ortega is really considered the father of microglia, or the discoverer of microglia. And um, I, I show this picture because um, the, ur the urban legend has it that um, Rio Ortega became very interested in microglia based on, again, on some of these um, kind of just uh, anatomical observations that they were making. They made all of these beautiful drawings of the, of the nervous system in different contexts. All of the little squiggly guys here are the microglia. So there are small cell with small cell bodies and lots of elaborate processes. Again, the urban legend has it that Rio Ortega um, told, um, or sorry, Ramon y Cajal told uh, his student, Rio Ortega, um, not to waste his time paying attention to these cells because they didn't do anything. Um, that they were just a waste of time. And, and we have all of the original um, papers, actually, to, to back this up. So maybe it's more than urban legend. Um, so he thought, you know, they're really not important cells. They don't have any function in the nervous system. Stop paying attention to them. But apparently, Ortega was very fascinated by them and spent a lot of time working out the staining conditions on postmortem brains to really visualize these cells. And he also said something that turned out to be um, absolutely prescient, which, which was that he, he said, you know, they look like they are um, cells from another place. They, they look like they're invaders from, from like another land. And that turned out to be absolutely correct. So one of the reasons I'm so fascinated by microglia, and as are many people, I think, um, is that they are one of the, if not the only, kind of resident, uh, resident uh, cells of the central nervous system that don't come from the central nervous system. So in, in fact, as I told you, when that neural tube is first developing and cells are proliferating and migrating and becoming a brain, microglia don't come from that tissue. In fact, where they come from is the, is the fetal yolk sac. So during embryogenesis, um, this is a picture of a mid-gestation mouse. So this is kind of the embryo here, but what is uh, kind of uh, poking out here on the side is the fetal yolk sac, which um, of course provides nutrients to the developing fetus. And all these little black blobby things here are um, basically labeled primitive macrophages. Um, so macrophages um, will then come into the developing organism, and they will then uh, populate every tissue of the body. So this is a process known as primitive hematopoiesis. So again, in a very early embryonic um, state, they come from these uh, yolk sac blood islands, and they become these stem cells. And then every tissue of the body, the brain, the lungs, the liver, uh, you name it, receives its kind of initial population of macrophages. And these are the critical kind of innate host defense cells of the organism. So what is unique about the microglia, however, is that the brain is the only tissue of the body 
that only receives one initial shot of these stem cells. And this is because the blood-brain barrier closes. So the rest of the tissues of the body receive continued uh, infiltration from the bone marrow. So this is a, a kind of ongoing process known as definitive hematopoiesis. So there's turnover of these macrophage populations in most tissues of the body, although this does vary by, by the tissue of interest. But the brain gets just this initial population of primitive cells that become microglia, and then that's it. That's what sustains the population of microglia throughout the entire lifespan. And these cells take up residence in every brain region. There's varying densities depending on where you look, but they live a very long time. They're important for things like synaptic pruning. They're important for many other aspects of brain development that we're probably not even aware of. But it's a very interesting kind of developmental time point to think about the fact that they're coming into the brain during development. And the question then became, for me at least, um, if they're uh, coming in during this time, this is the, the single kind of shot that the brain gets for this population of cells. What happens if you have an inflammatory stimulus that occurs during development for their proliferation, for their long-term function, and ultimately what implications does this have for neurological disorders? Um, so, so this is kind of why I've been so fascinated by microglia and trying to understand the role that events during the prenatal period have in particular on brain development and ultimately outcomes for that individual. So I think this crowd needs no introduction to autism, but I'll, uh, I will comment on it briefly anyway. So as you know, um, it is a very heterogeneous, divor uh, diverse disorder, but at its core, it is of course characterized by um, behavioral deficits, including social deficits, communication deficits, repetitive behaviors. Increasingly, we think there are subsets that are associated with immune dysfunction, with GI dysfunction, and many other um, kinds of, of um, phenotypes, and I'll, I'll get back to that in, in a bit. Of course, um, we're all aware that the prevalence of autism um, is, seems to be steadily on the rise. Um, a lot of this, of course, uh, we, we know is due to increasing diagnostic or expansion of diagnostic criteria and uh, just more diagnosis, more attention. Um, but we also think, uh, many of us in the field, that some of this increase is real. And of course, it is an incredibly interesting uh, disorder because it is one of the most sex-biased disorders. Um, about four to one males to females, although there is the growing sense that it is underdiagnosed in females. But nonetheless, we're very interested in this sex bias in autism and the mechanisms that may underlie that. So as I mentioned, there, um, there are many people now in the field, including the people in this room, um, that have noted and categorized um, immune abnormalities in ASD, so at least a, a subset of, of individuals with autism um, appear to have um, alterations in their immune system. So the work of Judy Vanderwater and others showing presence of autoantibodies, um, some of which are brain specific in individuals with autism. There have been reports of alterations in lymphocytes, um, which are more of the adaptive immune side. Um, alterations in uh, stimulated responses, so the inflammatory responses um, from uh, monocytes isolated from individuals. There's an intriguing increase in the incidence of autoimmune disorders and allergies in families of patients with autism and potentially in the patients themselves. And then finally, what uh, really uh, captured my interest a few years ago now is that there have been uh, many reports now of changes in glial cells within the brain, both microglia and astrocytes, but again, primarily focusing on microglia. Um, so this is just one example um, where if you look at a postmortem um, brain from ASD here versus a control, um, 
So you don't have to know anything about microglia to see that they look very different in these two brains. Um, the ones in ASD look uh, what we call reactive or, or even dystrophic. Um, of course, this is postmortem. Uh, it's always difficult to understand what's causal here, you know, what's coming first. But clearly, something seems to be different about the microglia in the brains of patients with autism. And this is just one of a series of papers um, that has come out in the last um, 20 years or so. Um, perhaps the most convincing, um, though for me at least, and what started me thinking, you know, I really need to start paying attention um, to the potential role of microglia in autism have been uh, more um, gene expression studies, um, specifically transcriptome studies um, performed by Dan Geshwin, um, and now others have um, emerged to kind of support these findings, which shows that if you look not at the genetic mutations that are present in the brains of individuals with autism, but rather what does gene expression look like in the brains of individuals. Um, what you see is a particular enrichment onto uh, changes in synapse genes, so genes that are present in those connections between neurons and microglial genes. Um, so when I try to kind of explain conceptually what these transcriptome studies are doing, the way I think about it anyway, is that if, if you think of a, of a library and you think, so rather than asking from a genetic mutation perspective, um, is a given book present in your library or not? Rather, the question you're asking with these gene expression activity studies is, you know, how often has a given book been read? You know, is, is a certain set of books being read a lot or is a certain set of books really not being read very much? And so, again, what, what they, they've consistently found is that those genes or those books that are important uh, for uh, this communication between neurons, synaptic genes, are down-regulated in their expression, so as if they are underactive. And then those genes that are important for the immune system seem to be overactive. And subsequent studies by this same group have shown that this is really uh, converging onto microglial genes. So the microglia seem to be reactive or overreactive, the synaptic connections between neurons underactive. And the other thing I'll point out for those of you who think about GWAS studies is that the synaptic pathology genes that are downregulated really converge quite a lot with the GWAS studies, so the genetic mutations that you see, um, suggesting that these changes are, are really accounting for what we know is a large heritable component to autism. But the immune changes don't converge very well with GWAS at all, suggesting that these are spontaneous mutations, um, they're de novo mutations, and we think this is probably due to environmental factors. I think increasingly we know that there's a gene by environment interaction occurring in autism. Which brings me to what I'll talk about um, for the rest of the, of the lecture is um, what are the environmental factors in particular that may be important in autism spectrum disorder. We know a tremendous amount of work and progress has been done in the, in the realm of genetic mutations. Much less attention has been paid to the role of the environment, um, although again, excluding many of the people in this room um, who have really uh, led the charge on this. Um, but I would say that it's probably because it, maybe it's harder to model. A lot of these things are difficult to model because it's usually mixtures of different things and multiple factors. And as I'll show you, that's very much the case for what we've found as well. But nonetheless, many groups have tried to really made, make progress in this area of what are the environmental factors that might be important in something like autism. And a commonly used model in the field now in animal research is the so-called maternal immune activation model in which generally a proxy for an infectious agent um, is given to the mother during gestation this induces a particular cytokine response. This then changes the way the brain develops, and then you see um, behavioral abnormalities in the offspring. And so again, most of the mimics um, of, of infection that have been used act on these innate immune receptors known as 
uh, called toll-like receptors. So again, this is really a focus on, on the, in, the potential infectious origins of uh, autism. And this is based on the epidemiology. There certainly um, have been links uh, that have been shown. However, when I started thinking about this and um, uh, kind of working on models of autism in my own lab, um, I kind of kept coming back to this, uh, what seems like a very striking increase in the incidence of autism. Again, setting aside the increase that's most certainly due to diagnosis, but the, the fact that there seems to also be a real increase in the prevalence. And in thinking about what are the types of environmental factors that may underlie this, um, it didn't seem that infection was a likely candidate for having changed very much, right? So in fact, if we think about what was driving inflammation in kind of a pre-modern era, certainly infection was a dominant factor. That's no longer the case. Um, we're not dying from infections so much, uh, or even suffering from infections as much as we are uh, suffering from inflammation, which we may attribute or call uh, so-called sterile inflammation, which is attributable to factors um, that are probably non-infectious in origin. So um, this brings me to the model that I'll talk about today and the work that I've been doing for, for many years now um, in collaboration with the EPA, which is to try to understand the impact that air pollution might have on the developing brain and whether this might be um, a, a, a link to autism. And of course, um, I didn't think of this on my own. <laughs> there are many epidemiological studies. Uh, again, uh, those have been led by uh, people here at UC Davis um, showing that it is, in fact, one of the strongest epidemiological links to autism. So we're doing all of this in mice. Um, I just an aside, you know, the question uh, is often, especially from a clinical perspective, what can we possibly hope to understand about autism based on mice? Um, and I would say that, of course, we're not trying to recapitulate every aspect of autism in an animal model, but I think there are certainly things, fundamental aspects of the way mice uh, kind of try to uh, engage in the world that are similar to humans. So social behavior being um, actually quite important for mice similar to humans. Um, they have communication, which we can't hear with our own ears, but we use specialized microphones to detect it. Um, and they can engage in kind of repetitive behaviors as well. So I think we can try to get at some of the core phenotypes of what autism is using a mouse model. So this is the model that we're using, and we do this work in collaboration with the Environmental Protection Agency. So one of the primary toxic components of air pollution is diesel exhaust, and we are using diesel exhaust particles that have been collected by the EPA. And so this is literally what we breathe, depending on our own proximity to highways or roadways. And we expose mice intermittently during pregnancy to these particles. And what this does is it induces in the mother kind of a, a low-grade persistent inflammatory response. Um, so it's, it's essentially this kind of sterile inflammation that I was referring to. So we do see some changes in the offspring exposed to this uh, at the level of the immune system, as you might suspect. Of course, that's the job of the immune system. We do see some changes in microglia. Um, and I'm not going to talk really in detail about that just in the interest of time. Um, what I'd like to kind of cut right to the chase about is whether this might be uh, relevant at all for autism. So do we see any of the behavioral changes that might be consistent with a model for autism? Because, you know, at the end of the day, uh, autism is an interesting uh, uh, thing to study because unlike many neurological disorders, um, there's not really a known pathology associated with autism. Um, and I'll get to that a little bit later, too. It's kind of like, you know, 
where do we look and what do we look for? It's not like Alzheimer's or Parkinson's where you, you, you pretty much know, okay, let's start here. Um, autism is both frustrating and interesting for this reason, but it, it, at, the, at the beginning, we know that it's associated with behavioral abnormalities, so that's kind of where we started. So, does it alter behavior in the offspring? And the answer is no. <laughs> so, it's, so far, it's a terrible model for autism. Uh, so we don't see social deficits. We don't see cognitive deficits. They seem like you know pretty well-adjusted mice. Um, but going into this, um, I, I actually wasn't really surprised by this. Um, so even though I just spent all this time telling you that air pollution is bad and that it's linked to autism, um, we know, based on epidemiological studies, that any one environmental factor, or indeed any one genetic mutation, of which there are many at this point, any one alone is only weakly predictive of autism. And again, I think this is one of the challenges in the field, that you really ha are talking about pretty, pretty small odds ratios. So that automatically tells us that we have combinations of factors that are interacting, right? And so our question is, might there be multiple factors that are converging onto inflammatory pathways uh, to change the way the brain develops? So the question now becomes, are certain populations more vulnerable to the same level of environmental toxin? Because, of course, we're all exposed to air pollution at this point. I think the WHO estimates that 92% of the world's population is um, exposed to pollutant levels that are above the recommended levels. So 92%. So um, it's and you know so it's a problem. But of course, uh, everyone exposed during gestation uh, does not have autism. So what are the what are the modifying factors for disease and why? So again, um, we were inspired by the epidemiology here, the work of Roz Wright and others now, um, at, and many have shown this uh, in different models, that maternal stress is a strong predictor of uh, disease outcomes. In this case, looking at asthma in children. Um, of course, air pollution um, has a link with asthma outcomes in children as well. And what's so interesting about these data is that um, if you think about kind of allergen exposure levels in the home and link it to something like like asthma, there's a certain threshold that, that needs to be reached in order for asthma uh, to occur, but um, it's not a very linear relationship beyond that threshold. Um, rather, it just seems to be a pretty steep kind of stepwise um, relationship. And what she's shown and others have shown is that maternal stress, reported levels of stress by the mother is, is very strongly predictive. Um, so we, we thought that was very intriguing and really wanted to understand what the biological method uh, mechanisms might be. So we incorporate stress into our paradigm. Um, so in the last third of gestation, uh, they, and they've received either, again, the control solution or diesel exhaust particles intermittently. Um, we then take half of each group and, ex and further expose them to this stress paradigm. And the stressor that we're using in mice is a nest restriction paradigm, which was developed by Tally Barham at UC Irvine. And um, it's an it's a intriguing model because in their hands, they've done this postnatally. So while the moms are caring for their pups, they, they simply have fewer resources to do so. You know, mice don't have a whole lot in their, in their cages, but what they do usually have is this nest material. They build this nice nest around the pups, and they simply take away some of that material and some of the bedding. And what you see is a very uh, striking phenotype, increased stress reactivity in the mothers, increased stress reactivity in the offspring. Now, the complicating uh, thing with their model, which they do postnatally, is that they see changes in maternal care. So the moms are stressed, so they're, they're not taking as good care of their pups. We decided to restrict this nest restriction to the prenatal period. So quite literally, when the, the moms are in nesting mode, before the pups are born, we take some of the nest material away from them. So this is kind of you know, very much a psychological stressor now. 
And lucky for us, once the pups are born, or really right before, we give them back normal nest material, and we see no changes in maternal care in our model. Um, so it simplifies our interpretation and really allows us to kind of focus on what's happening during that prenatal window. And so what I'll show you is that we do see here a, a true synergism in terms of the impact on the offspring. So I'll show you just a bit of the behavior data, um, but the two kind of most striking um, are changes in ultrasonic vocalizations at postnatal day eight and changes in social behavior at postnatal day 30. And again, all of the data I'll show you going forward is just two groups, which is our control group and our two hit group, the two hits being both diesel and stress. And we really don't see any behavioral changes if you don't have both. So it's, it's kind of a two hit model. So first looking at the ultrasonic vocalizations, this is in very young pups here. Again, they, they get isolated from the mother for just uh, a very brief time, one to three minutes, and immediately they start to kind of call, they're ca presumably calling out for their mother. And we can use a program um, to really decipher what the syllables are so we can kind of, uh, to the best of our ability, try to figure out what they're saying. And what we find is that in both males and females, there's a pretty striking difference in this calling. So in the two hit group, they are making more calls, so more ultrasonic vocalizations. But the calls are less complex, so they're shorter, and they have more kind of short syllables as opposed to the longer, more complex syllables. And then in adult males, we see the same thing. So we can't do this in females, so we don't know if it's still there, but in males, if you put them in with a, uh, a, an adult female, an estrus female, um, they basically start to sing. So they do these little, uh, these little mating calls, and we can record that. And here again, what we see is the same thing. Um, so this is basically just looking at um, the, the syllable length or the syllable complexity of the calls. And the vehicle or the control animals um, are, are making um, very kind of long, complex, more complex language, basically. Whereas our two hit males, they're still calling, but it's much less complex. It's mostly these kind of short, choppy syllables. So something is very different about how they're communicating. And then uh, looking at social behavior, which um, is probably, um, I guess, the, the gold standard for uh, autism relevant behavior in mice. Um, and of course, the, the uh, inventor of this paradigm is also here. You, have, you guys have everybody here. Um, uh, Jackie Crawley, in which we, at, we simply ask, uh, how much time do they spend interacting with something like an object? In this case, we use a rubber duck on one side versus another mouse. Most mice prefer to interact with a novel mouse that they've never met before. In our males, what we see is that in, in our two hit males, they are not very interested in the mouse, but in fact are much more interested in the object. And so if you put these two together to create a kind of a percent sociability, we see that our males exposed to the dual prenatal stressors um, have a very low kind of social score. And interestingly, females have normal social behavior. So even though their, their calling was different early in life, regardless of the prenatal exposures, they have normal social behavior. So are there synaptic or microglial changes in this model? So can we try to understand what the mechanisms might be here? Um, <clears throat> well, as I mentioned a few moments ago, Autism is hard because um, the, our first question was, where do we look? Um, <laughs> which brain region do we look in? Uh, because social behavior is incredibly complex. Um, communication is incredibly complex. And, and all of these things work in kind of circuits, right? So, so probably multiple brain regions being affected. So we wanted to try to take a relatively unbiased approach here. And so working with our collaborator at Duke, Kaf Sarasa, who is an amazing um, electrophysiologist and, uh, and, and engineer, uh, is doing these very um, uh, kind of 
sophisticated recordings where he's simultaneously recording the brain activity of multiple different brain regions at the same time. And he's doing this in mice as they're walking around a uh, three-chamber task, and he's basically asking, what do the brain waves look like when they're interacting with an object versus when they're interacting with a mouse? And so the goal here is to try to understand what does a normal social circuit look like? And as you might imagine, when you're recording from this many different brain regions at once, it's kind of a uh, a bio, you know, a bioinformatics nightmare, right? So he's using a machine learning approach to basically feed in all of this information and ask, and truly, in an unbiased way, a machine to pull out patterns. And he's doing this in a number of just control mice, first of all, to see, you know, basically, what is the circuit that's activated during interacting with an object versus interacting with a mouse? And can you use this machine learning approach to predict whether they're interacting with a mouse or an object? Um, so maybe a better illustration of this is this is a recent paper that they've published where they've used this approach very successfully. This is a different paradigm. This is a social defeat stress paradigm. But what they were able to do is after a mouse was confronted by a, a scary mouse a number of times, um, we know that m certain mice, after being socially defeated, become depressed or they look depressed to us. Um, but some mice don't and they have this resilient phenotype. And so they wanted to use this approach to ask, can they look at the brain activity alone during their interaction with this aggressive mouse and predict which ones will then go on to develop depression versus ones that will be resilient? And the answer was yes. So they were basically using this very sci-fi kind of spying on the brain to predict their later behavior. So can we do the same thing in our mice? And I won't go into the data because it's, it's pretty uh, intense. <laughs> but the short answer is yes. So in our control mice, we were able to use their brain activity to predict whether they were interacting with an object or a social stimulus. So a slightly different question, but just trying to say, is this a valid approach to ask you know, whether the brain is distinguishing between these two things? However, in our two hit mice, especially in males, they did not distinguish at all between an object and a mouse. It's almost as if they couldn't tell the difference between them, which was very, very striking. So clearly the social kind of circuit in our exposed mice is functioning different. So then the, the question, of course, becomes which part of the circuit is different? And this is also a complicated question, and we think probably there are multiple parts in the circuit that are different. But if you look at the connectivity between different brain regions and ask, is there a particular circuit that's most disrupted, one emerged right away. And that was this connection between the thalamus, which is kind of widely considered the sensory switchboard of the brain, and this part of the cortex called the anterior cingulate cortex. We thought this was very interesting because if you look at the literature on autism, this brain region has emerged again and again as being altered in autism. And we know it's critical for many of the behaviors that are disrupted in autism, including social cognition, communication, and sensory integration. And so in autism, it has been reported as smaller in volume in ASD. Um, and it's specifically been um, reported to be hypoactive um, and specifically decreased glutamatergic uh, input, so glutamatur glutamate being the primary excitatory neurotransmitter in the brain. And we can measure this kind of connection between the thalamus and the anterior cingulate cortex by assessing the numbers of these types of synapses called uh, VGLU2 positive synapses. This is just a marker that we use to label this particular kind of synapse. And so again, these are these long range long-range projections from the thalamus into the cortex 
And specifically, we're looking in this synaptic zone of the cortex, um, this layer one. And we can also look at whether these more short-range projections, called intracortical projections, are altered. And we label these using a marker for V-glute two, or for V-glute one, sorry. So looking at these two kinds of synapses. And how do we do this? So we simply take a brain section and we use an immunohistochemical approach and we label the presynaptic marker, in this case V-glute one or V-glute two, with one colored antibody, and then we label the postsynaptic marker with a different color, and then we look at the convergence of the two. So just to ask the question of this, if this is actually uh, a functional synapse. And we're looking at a number of time points in development to ask questions about whether the synapse number has changed. We look early on at postnatal day eight, which is when we saw the changes in USV production. And this is a time when synapses are really still forming in this part of the brain. We also look at postnatal day 15 when the synapses are being refined. And so many of the synapses will actually be removed, um, again, uh, just as a part of normal development. And then we can look at later, postnatal day 100, just when these, these synapses are stable. So this is the early time point, postnatal day eight, and right away we saw a very striking difference in our two groups. So this is all males. I do have data on females, but I've, I've restricted it to males for the rest of the talk because that's really where we see the most striking phenotype. And at this time, we see more than a double-fold increase and the number of these VGLU2 positive synapses. So these synapses that are projections from the thalamus into the anterior cingulate cortex. But by postnatal day 15, this reverses. So they have fewer synapses compared to controls. And this is maintained into postnatal day 100, suggesting that this is a very persistent change. So they kind of have this early overshoot of the number of synapses followed by an undershoot. And it's not at all the same thing, but we thought this was quite intriguing because there have been reports in autism of an early overgrowth of some brain regions followed by an atrophy. Um, and so again, it's not the same thing because it's maybe different levels of analysis. We're not looking at volume of the whole brain region, but it is in, you know, intriguing that it kind of fits that pattern. So finally, are there changes in microglia? Um, so remember I told you way at the beginning that one of the important jobs of microglia is to eat synapses during development. And we're kind of agnostic at this point about whether their role in synapse formation or development or refinement might be because of pruning or they might be doing something like secreting growth factors of some sort. But nonetheless, we started with pruning because it's actually one of the more accessible things to, to, uh, to measure. Um, so first we wanted to simply label all of our microglia so that we could then ask questions whether they were removing synapses. And here we actually um, got to something quite interesting um, and unexpected. And that was that um, we discovered a very striking phenotypic change in the microglia in the same part of the brain where the synapses are altered. And so what I mean by that is that everybody who studies microglia practically, uses this marker called IBA1 to measure the synapses, or measure these cells uh, in, in tissue sections. And they all use this marker because it's thought to be what we call constitutive, meaning it's always there, and it labels every cell. So it's this great marker to use. Well, we did that, but we noticed right away, or rather my graduate student doing the work <laughs> noticed right away, um, that the tissue seemed like it had holes in it. So she came to me and she said, there are, there are stripes of tissue in the cortex that seem to have no cells. And I said, well, what do you mean by that? And she said, well, they just seem to be missing cells. So we used another marker, which also is supposed to label all microglia. And this is what's called a purinergic receptor. Um, that again, we use it because it labels all the cells. And we noticed right away that when we do, we do a co-localization with these proteins, 
um, that we have essentially uncovered two very different populations of microglia. So some are labeling exclusively for one marker, and some are labeling exclusively for the other marker. And we've truly never seen this sort of thing before. And these pictures will probably show you a bit better, and hopefully you can see it in this light, that if you look through a stack of cortex, so this is kind of moving from the top of the brain down, that in the same area where we're seeing those very dramatic changes in synapse number, that we have stripes of microglia that just look weird. <laughs> so not unlike the, the postmortem sections that we saw in human brain, but we're kind of molecularly defining the cells here too by using these different protein markers. And so again, some cells are only labeling for IBA1 and some are only labeling for P2Y or 12. This is another view of that where they just stand out to all the purple cells here are cells that are labeling for both, which is supposed to be what all cells are doing. But we have these cells that are just standing out. And then moreover, we have cells, these microglia, that are making little chains with each other as if they're, they're uh, talking to each other and they're connected physically. And we don't know what this means yet um, because we've never seen anything like it. But we see this exclusively in brains that have been exposed to the prenatal uh, stressors. We don't see it at all in our control brains. Well, trying to dig into the literature, we um, uh, are aware of the recent work of Beth Stevens' um, lab at Harvard. And Beth Stevens, as, as many of you know, is the first person to have shown that microglia eat synapses during development. And she recently published this paper just looking at normal um, microglia during development, that there are distinct subtypes of microglia during development, but it's very early. So, so basically, this kind of heterogeneity that we're seeing um, may be just a consequence of normal um, development. But it's supposed to be done, basically, by the first postnatal week. So we wondered, well, maybe we're just seeing a, a prolongation of this heterogeneity. And so we um, quantified what we're calling heterogeneity. And what I mean by that is simply that they're only labeling for one protein versus a different protein. And indeed, only our kind of two hit males are showing this striking increase in heterogeneity. And this is at postnatal day eight. And it really peaks at postnatal day eight. It's still high at postnatal day 15, and then it's completely gone by postnatal day 25. So controls have some amount of this, but it's much lower. So basically, we have this, uh, what we think is maybe a delay in the maturation of these cells. So, so what? Um, are there any functional differences in these cells? And so this is a harder question to answer. But w again, one of the things we know microglia do is that they eat synapses. And so are there differences in the kind of phagocytic capacity of the cells? And so we uh, compared these two kind of separate subtypes of microglia that we're seeing, those that co-label for both versus exclusively labeling for one marker, and asked, is there a change in this um, phagocytic function in the cells, and specifically the CD68, which is a, a lysosomal marker, which is important for them degrading material that they might be eating. And indeed, that's exactly what we found, is that in a certain subtype, which we see very highly expressed in our two-hit males, they have a decrease in this phagocytic capacity. And this is at postnatal day eight, which is the very time when they have kind of double the number of synapses. So we think that whatever is causing this kind of delay in maturation of microglia is then inducing this deficit in their ability to engulf synapses, and that this is then changing synapse number. So putting it all together, um, what I've shown you so far is that these two uh, kind of prenatal stressors converge onto microglia. It changes their heterogeneity with a subtype that's associated with this decrease in eating uh, behavior. We see changes in the number of these specific kinds of synapses 
And uh, importantly, we see changes in the way the circuit is working and changes in behavior. So there's just one more story that I would like to share with you, which is getting back to people. <laughs> so we're starting to think um, about microglia. Uh, you know, of course, we think of them maybe as a as a therapeutic potential, um, but even if they're not able to be targeted directly for therapy. Uh, we increasingly think of them essentially as the, the canary in the coal mine, right? So they are the exquisitely sensitive cells in the brain to perturbations of, of homeostasis. And can we see any evidence in patients with autism that might indicate uh, changes in their function in a way that um, even if we can't directly target their function, it might be kind of leading us in the direction um, of an immune subtype of autism, which, which we can then kind of try to categorize. So some of the work that um, we've been doing um, at MGH is in collaboration um, with the Martinez Imaging Center, specifically Jacob Hooker and Nicole Zerker, and working with the Lurie Center um, to recruit a population of adults with autism that we can do PET imaging in and try to get a sense of whether uh, there is ongoing inflammation in the brains of people with autism. And this is not a trivial thing to do. First of all, the ligands that we have available are um, fairly nonspecific, so some of you are probably well familiar with um, ligands for a protein called TSPO. Um, but this is a protein that's highly expressed in microglia as well, as well as other glial cells. And it's been reported in many neurological disorders now to kind of go up and down with inflammation. Um, so we're using kind of one of the latest generation ligands for TSPO. The main reason, of course, that this isn't trivial to do is that these are, um, these are patients that um, often are very anxious, and uh, the last thing they want to do is lay, lie inside a scanner like that for an hour, which is loud and scary. They have done at the Martino Center what I think is truly a heroic uh, study in which they are scanning not just so-called high-functioning people with autism, but uh, including low and moderate functioning, so people who are nonverbal, um, people who are very anxious, and doing all of this without anesthesia um, through a series of very intense training protocols and habituation protocols. Um, and so I'll show you um, the data so far. It's ongoing, but again, just this is the ligand that we're using to try to get a sense of whether there might be inflammation um, in the brains of, um, uh, this is all adults because we don't do PET imaging in kids um, due, the, due to the radioactivity. Um, but um, so it's, it's hopefully giving us kind of a snapshot of what's happening. So um, this is just one example, one of the wonderful things about working with the Lurie Center is that they have such um, comprehensive clinical phenotyping, um, so they can really ask questions about the imaging outcome and then um, all of the clinical characteristics of that population. Um, and so uh, this is just an example in which they're seeing uh, a so-called hot spot of binding of this radioligand in the fusiform gyrus, and this is in a patient that has pretty profound gaze aversion. Um, and so it's kind of an interesting thing for them to think about um, you know, what are the characteristics of binding in a given individual? Um, so this is not a numbers game <laughs> because there are very few patients that they're able to scan. But that said, they are starting to see patterns even in the few number of patients that they've been able to scan. But to just give you a sense of the difficulty of doing this study, they started with probably about a thousand candidates to go through scanning, and these are all so-called idiopathic autism, so no known genetic mutations. We're really trying to get a sense of what might be environmentally driven here. Um, and they've gotten about 15 patients that they've been able to successfully scan. So starting with 1,000 
down to 15. So that's kind of the scale. One thing that's really important is that um, if they do repeated scans in a single patient, they see that this is a stable signature. So this is not hopping around depending on different, you know, if they have a cold or something like that, which is obviously an important thing. So we do think while there's heterogeneity across different um, patients, it is stable within a given patient. So uh, the result of about five or six years of work is that we found exactly the opposite of what we were expecting, um, which is still really exciting. And that is that patients as a group have decreased binding of this radioligand, suggestive of decreased levels of TSBO. And one of the brain regions that stands out, if you do a post hoc comparison of what are the brain regions that are consistent across patients, is the anterior cingulate cortex, which we were pretty excited to learn. Um, so uh, we don't know what TSBO function is <laughs> in microglia or in other cell types, but to me, um, I think this, with, along with lots of data now, is suggesting that it's not a, actually an indicator of inflammation. But if it is, in fact, a change in microglia, and we're working on this in kind of cell culture and animal models, we think it may be, in fact, indicating impaired microglial function in these individuals as opposed to kind of overt chronic inflammation. And so, you know, uh, take that for what it is, uh, given what we know in the humans, but if we relate it back to the, the animal model, again, in our mouse uh, brains, uh, what we're seeing really is an impaired phagocytic function, at least in that subtype of microglia. Um, so we think, you know, this may be really a novel way of thinking about what the function of these cells is, and it, should we be thinking not about tamping down immune signaling or inflammation, but rather should we be thinking of ways that we could rescue function in this cell type. And with that, I will end and thank all of the members of my lab, of course, all of my collaborators that I've tried to highlight throughout, um, and uh, also just to point out a lot of the data that I've showed you, or the clinical data at the end is supported by um, Robert and Donna Landreth Family Foundation. So thank you. What would happen or what does happen if you take the double hit moms or pups and give them some anti-inflammatory agent? We haven't studied that. Um, <clears throat> we don't really know how much of a, um, a systemic inflammatory uh, response there is, uh, at least prenatally. Um, we know that the moms have macrophage inf infiltration of the lung in response to the particles, and there may be a fairly localized inflammation in the lung, and which we're very interested in but haven't done a lot of work in that, but there, it may be this kind of vagal connection to, to the brain. Um, so no, we haven't done that. Um, we have looked at um, specifically manipulating uh, microglia in a more genetic way. Um, if we, uh, uh, I didn't go into those data because I ran out of time, but um, we know that toll-like receptor signaling in microglia is actually critical for the response to the diesel particles. And if we ablate toll-like receptor signaling in the microglia, can we prevent the whole thing? Um, and so that's what we're doing now. But as far as kind of a, a systemic inflammatory um, inhibition. Uh, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I don't love that idea, I think, for the reasons that I just, just said, because I don't know that this is a kind of overt inflammation that's happening, but rather there's a reprogramming of the cells that's um, changing their, their normal kind of homeostatic function. I'm curious to hear your thoughts, I'll dig a little bit deeper on the sex effects and the fact that the, the females are not really showing signal in terms of behavior and brain um, outcomes, and I'm wondering if, if you have already done this, if you've moved past the three-chamber social approach to look at reciprocal social interactions or anything else that might pick up on more subtle deficits in the females. Yeah, so the, um, the other social tasks that we have done is still in the three chambers, but we've also done social novelty. 
and um, in which you expose mice to either, in our case, we're doing their cage mate, so it's like their sibling that they're very familiar with versus a novel mouse on the other side. And our control mice prefer the novel mouse, and our uh, two hit males and females in this case actually prefer their cage mate. So we are detecting a little bit, I think, of anxiety in the females there. Um, the other thing that we've done, um, which I didn't really go into, which is in the course of the multi-unit recording where we're recording from different brain regions while they're interacting with a stimulus. So that's a pretty intense paradigm <laughs> where we do it 10 minutes a day for 10 subsequent days. And that's because you know, we really need a ton of recording to be able to you know, make sense of that, how the circuit is functioning and it's not just kind of hopping around from one day to the next. So you, you do a lot of recording so you don't have artifacts. I'm bringing this up because we can also look at how their behavior is changing over time. And what's quite interesting is that by the end of that 10 days of social behavior, our control males actually look less social than our two hit uh, males because the control males start out being really social and then by the 10 days, by the end, they're no longer <laughs> interested. They habituate, which is what we see in just normal control mice. And our, our two hit males don't habituate. And it looks like females might be somewhat similar in that regard too. Although again, it's just always a little less uh, pronounced. It's, a, it's just a little uh, more subtle. Um, so I think that there's a lot there in terms of the social behavior and, um, and I agree that we need to kind of get more sophisticated in terms of, of assessing social behavior. Um, one thing I will say that we're really interested in in terms of the sex difference and the biology of the sex difference is that we are, because of the TSBO findings, TSBO is a, is a protein expressed in the, uh, the outer mitochondrial membrane, so I, I became very interested in mitochondrial function, which of course has a long storied past with autism. <laughs> and so um, a lot of people interested in that and it's kind of waxed and waned over the years, but we've become increasingly interested in mitochondrial function, specifically in microglia. And I can tell you, we've, we, we now have a mitochondrial biologist in the lab, and he has found some of the biggest sex differences I have ever seen in my whole career, which is that in response to the same inflammatory stimulus, in this case just using something like lipopolysaccharide, mitochondrial function is profoundly affected in males, again, specifically in microglia, and not at all in females. So gene expression goes down in males, their respiratory function goes down in males very persistently. Females, it's as if they have not gotten a challenge at all. And so I think there may be something very fundamental about the biology of microglia that's different between males and females. And so that's something that uh, we're going to go back to the very beginning on and start phenotyping male versus female yolk sac macrophages to see when that sex difference might actually emerge and to try to understand it, because I think there's something important there. So there's a lot of literature in the toxicology side, sorry, the toxicologist in me is coming out, showing that maternal stress changes disposition of, of toxic agents. And I think this has also been shown for particulate matter as well. So have you guys looked at all at the effects of maternal stress on the disposition of the particulate matter in the diesel exhaust particulate stuff you're using? When you say disposition, do you mean where? How much is getting to the brain and across the placenta into the fetal brain? No, we have not. I would love to have a collaborator help me do that <laughs> because <laughs> because I think it's probably really important. And, uh, and it's really interesting because microglia will phagocytize these particulate um, these particles, the ultrafine particulate matter, and so that could be uh, occurring totally independent of any inflammatory response. But maternal stress does change um, how things are getting across the placenta. So that might be kind of fascinating to take a look at. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I would, I would love to work on that. So have you thought about your model in terms of heterogeneity of phenotypes? I mean, are, in terms of like 
timing of exposures, combinations of exposures as, as producing some of that variability? Yeah, so when I first started the diesel uh, work, um, I was working with people that were kind of thinking about you know, early exposure to one pollutant and then later exposure to like ozone, another, um, you know, uh, prominent source of, of air pollution and have done a little bit in that regard. And I've also combined the diesel particles with a later hit uh, in, in particular a high fat diet, which is, you know, very different, of course, from stress, but I guess from an immunology perspective, um, it seems to all come back to toll-like receptors, um, these kind of pattern recognition receptors um, kind of getting primed early and then responding to a second hit. But in terms of the timing, we haven't done really much there because, uh, except for the timing of the second hit. And it does seem to be, so in that case, we exposed throughout pregnancy with diesel and then later in adulthood put them on a high fat diet and you do see a very interesting phenotype there. But um, we're a little limited in mice because uh, if you stress them throughout pregnancy, for instance, they just don't have pups. They just resorb their fetuses. So it's um, if you do it early enough, you know. And so uh, a bit of a frustrating thing of working with mice. Um, I absolutely think, though, that timing is everything, right? And so in terms of this, the phenotype that you see, and we're thinking more and more about when the different circuits are developing, like when you, when you hit the circuit is going to you know, result in, in a different phenotype. And so if I had an army in my lab, maybe we could work on that. But um, I think that, yeah, it's, it's obviously an important question. Um, and, and I'm trying to think how much heterogeneity we see. It, you know, it's interesting behaviorally. One of the reasons I I love this model is that it's not very heterogeneous. I mean, like it's like clear as day in terms of the social behavior um, and even the synaptic changes. I mean, they they're they're non-overlapping populations, which as a basic scientist is really awesome. Um, but I you know I agree in terms of the clinical phenotype, it's not. It's probably not uh, as relevant. <laughs> so, from a kind of niche perspective and of of mouse models, and and from the genetics perspective, um, I I'm thinking about Abe Palmer had a paper in Neuron a couple years ago that showed one gene across many different background strains, and how it not being able to generalize across like past B6J. And the title of the paper and the take home message was basically that um, background strain is less generalizable than sex, which we know sex is um, pretty important. And so I was wondering if you have ever thought about ex doing the model or have ever explored doing the model beyond the B6J or on some sort of hybrid background that would show that it would generalize with more heterogeneity? It's a great question. You know, I started all of my work uh, years ago in rats, and I would love to go back to rats um, for some of this work. And the, the primary reason that I haven't done that is because the way that we instill the particles um, is, it, it doesn't work in rats, um, because you'd have to have a, a you, can't, you can't easily um, get the particles to kind of puff down their trachea, which is the way that we um, give them. Um, so we'd have to go back to the exposure kind of chambers that we did at the EPA initially. Um, that's not a very good reason, but that's just <laughs> the overly honest method, <laughs> right, of practicality of why we haven't done it in rats. Uh, I, I completely appreciate the, you know, the need to do this in different, um, in different species uh, uh, even. We have done it in different vendors, I can say. So many people in this room are well aware of the frustration with some of the maternal immune activation models, which depend not even on strain, but even the vendor that you get it from. Well, the vendors are actually substrates. Right. Because they breed them, and then they create spontaneous. So in that regard, we've done it both in Charles River and in Jackson. And we see the same phenotype. And, and we're very interested in the microbiome, and we've done some work on microbiome. It's a 
it seems to be a very, very robust model. Uh, I've also, importantly, uh, started it at Duke, did it at Duke, went to MGH, did it at MGH, and now I'm going back to Duke. So, so I'm confident that it will, you know, so it's, it's made the move. Um, it's generalized to different labs. It's generalized across different vendors. Um, but, you know, beyond that, uh, I would love to do it in wild mice, to be honest, because uh, a lot of these, like for instance, I worked on neonatal infection for most of my early career. And we know that if you do this neonatal infection model in wild rats, it totally does nothing. Because their immune system is completely different. And, and this gets back to that like evolved, how has our immune system evolved and changed over time? And that's a really important question. The UC Davis Mind Institute was created in 1998 with a promise to find cures for neurodevelopmental disorders. Every day, our physicians and researchers come closer to fulfilling that promise. Their groundbreaking research on autism, fragile X syndrome, chromosome 22Q11.2 deletion syndrome, ADHD, and other brain disorders are helping children achieve their fullest potential. Please visit our website to find out more about current studies upcoming events, and how you can help make a difference.